Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our third uh, uh, session of the day with IPEC. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. And today we have our team from McKendry University in Lebanon, Illinois. And for those that didn't get out, that are not judges, we have Cassandra Jett, we have Erica Schutzenhofer, we have Danielle Warren, and Austin Shar. Their advisor to, uh, for this project is Dr. John Waters, who is sitting right there. We will ask the, the uh, team to just quickly remind our judges who they are again before you start. And we will have 30 minutes of presentation to start with. And then after that, we will have a 20 minute judges challenge where the judges will have questions for you. And again, they are in their roles as restaurant executives. And then after that, we will have 10 minutes where the judges will give you some uh, constructive feedback for, uh, for your own growth in the future. I would ask everyone, or tell everyone, this is a good time to turn off your cell phones. And I believe, I, I told somebody today that I'm gonna make a million dollars when I create a name tag that doesn't do this. So I'm gonna do, okay. that, do that for you. <laughs> good luck to our catching up. Yeah, good luck to our team. Again, welcome to IVET, and we will let you get started when you're ready. All right, hello everybody, good morning. As we mentioned, we are McKinney University, and what we are going to have the judges see today are restaurant executives for large chains and major restaurant companies in the United States. Um, we are actually the National Restaurant Association, and what we will be discussing with you is the unhealthy eating habits that the restaurant industry has created, and what we think should be done about that. So the first thing that we're going to start you off with is a few are a few numbers. First number is 70%. 70% refers to approximately 70% of premature deaths are associated with unhealthy lifestyles, including unhealthy eating habits, drug use, alcohol use, and tobacco use. That comes from the CDC. Second numbers, 12 and 15. Yale University conducted a study in which they tested 20, or 12, uh, eight restaurants. Get my numbers eight different restaurants, and what they found, out of the 3,000 possible children's menu combinations, only 12 met the criteria set out by Yale University for preschoolers, and only 15 met the requirements for older children. 168 and 335. This it was done by the USDA, and what they found was the, this is the daily difference in caloric intake from 1971 to 2000. For men, this is 168 calories a day. For women, it's 335 calories a day. And what this amounts to is for men, on average, you're taking in an extra 17.5 pounds a year. For women, you're gaining an extra 35 pounds a year. And our final numbers are 144 and 233. A study was done, and that which showed that compared to the USDA recommended serving sizes, the average steak at a restaurant is 144% larger than the standard serving size, whereas a muffin for breakfast, which possibly some of you have had, averages 233% larger than the USDA recommendations. As we mentioned, we are at McKinder University, and we are covering what's eating you, which is unhealthy eating habits and restaurant responsibility. And as we mentioned, Austin, Danny, Cassie, and Erica. Okay, what's on the menu for today? We're gonna to talk about making a decision and a wise decision. Um, would you care for a salad? We're gonna talk about management and marketing perspectives, which Danielle will cover. Um, what, what's, would you like an appetizer? Desi, Desi, Cassie is going to be covering uh, ethical and legal issues a little bit. Um, Erica will be covering some financial aspects as well as part of our solution and then we're going to come back to me and I will be covering our main focus on our solution. So what's going on? As we have seen, there is an obesity epidemic going on in this country. Um, restaurants have the responsibility, in your case, you have the responsibility to either promote healthier, healthier alternatives in the restaurants or you can keep business as usual. Now, we will go into that a little bit more, um, but the industry as a whole is slow to make changes that help their customers because of some financial issues with that. There are concerns about profitability, and as we have all seen, why fix what isn't broken? We've heard that phrase several, several times, and it applies to the restaurant industry as well. 
Um, however, the system is broken because the customer's health is a major concern and it should be to the restaurants. Now, the last case is restaurants can be and may be ignoring the fact that there actually is a chance to increase profitability if they're willing to take the opportunity, which we'd like you to do, and we'll discuss that a little bit further. And now I will hand it over to Danny, who will be covering management and marketing aspects. Danny. Thank you, Austin. Um, so the first reason why managers are slow to change um, with offering healthy options is because they're afraid of losing money. Uh, the trend that we've seen over recent history is that increasing serving sizes is increasing profits. We need one of the restaurants to make that change and change to going back to the average serving size, but also still increasing their profits, obviously. Um, another reason is that uh, managers don't think people want to pay extra for healthier options, which in some cases is true. A recent study showed that 70% of people over the age of 50 do not want to spend more money on healthier options. And this is the same for 18 to 24 year olds. 44% of them think that prices should be the same for both healthier options and the normal menu items. Another way, um, kind of a blunt way of looking at this, is it's not your responsibility. Completely understandable. If you're making money, why should you change your strategy? Um, if someone wants to eat healthier, they have other options that they can go to. So if it's not harming you, why should you need to change? Next, I'm going to look into the marketing of how um, restaurants increase their sales and have more people come to their restaurants. So firstly, the use of buzzwords. So a buzzword is basically a keyword that is thrown out that people associate with healthy. So my first example of this is less fat. Uh, this sounds healthy and you think you are having less fat, but really how much less fat is that? The original product could be 10 grams and now you've only changed to nine. So really you're not saving as much as they made out. My next point is no added sugar. Uh, this purely means that they haven't added any extra sugar. It doesn't mean that there's no sugar in the product, which is very misleading to consumers when they buy items. Um, my next point, and possibly the worst one, is low or no fat. Um, basically, the fat is what usually supplies the flavor within food. So if they're removing this or reducing it, they're losing flavor. Therefore, they're gonna add salt or sugar to compromise this, which again, we know is not healthy for us. Um, a key example of this is Subway. They have their eat fresh tagline. The word fresh resembles healthy. Um, but as soon as you walk into Subway, they instantly throw in your face that you should buy a foot long, which is essentially two meals. Which this takes me to my next point on portion control. Um, this is very misleading. Uh, have you ever seen something that said only 100 calories and thought it's a great snack? But really, that's actually, uh, that container has two serving sizes. Therefore, you're eating double the calories that you really thought. Um, cereal is actually the biggest abuser of this, um, especially for adults. The cereal is tended towards children. Adults are now eating more cereal and the serving sizes just aren't up to par. Um, an example of this is bare naked banana nut, granola. Um, if you pour yourself a regular medium-sized bowl, you could be eating as much as a McDonald's double cheeseburger, in fact. Uh, the serving size on this is a quarter of a cup, which is only 140 calories, which sounds great. But pour yourself a whole cup, which is very easy to do, and you're eating 560 calories and 28 grams of fat. As you can see from our picture, um, this is four, more, uh, excuse me, four tablespoons is the recommended serving size of that cereal. So this relates still to the restaurant industry as we looked at an average sandwich, sandwich size um, portion and it is roughly five ounces. We looked at a local, pretty popular chain uh, sandwich restaurant and they have on their menu a sandwich that weighs 17.75 ounces. Just to go back, the average was five ounces. So that's over three times the average serving size of a sandwich. Uh, also burgers do this. Um, uh, they try to cover up their back by offering the regular average serving size but calling it something like a junior burger, making it seem a little less appealing to adults. Really they should flip this. The average burger should be called the regular, whatever it might be, and then if they want to make a burger three times the size, this should be an extra large or something. Um, and also another fact is that on average burger and fries has increased by 165 calories since 
1977. This number looks very similar to that um, calorie change between the 1970s and today that I also mentioned at the beginning. Um, next, we looked at some smoothies. A smoothie king, a smoothie from Smoothie King, a large strawberry, has 178 grams of sugar. That is eating the same as eight Kit Kats. I just showed you that the smoothie, again, a smoothie buzzword. Um, next, we have salads. Um, most people see the word salad and again associate this with healthy, but this isn't always the case. Add all the trimmings, the croutons, the bacon bits, <laughs> the dressings, and your salad can go from being very healthy to very fattening pretty quick. Now we have an example of this at a local chain restaurant. Um, their buffalo chicken salad has double the amount of calories as an eight ounce bacon cheeseburger. Um, so you're probably thinking, well no one goes to a restaurant and orders just the burger. So you add a portion of fries to that and a side of onion rings and you're still eating 100 calories less than that buffalo chicken salad. That just shows how salads are very deceiving and restaurants are quick to mislead their customers into thinking you're eating a salad, therefore you've gone for a healthier option. Also salads are expensive. Um, most people don't want to pay close to steak price for a salad uh, when it's something they could essentially make at home pretty easy. And also they have that uh, mentality of if they're going out to eat and paying money, then I'm going to get a salad. It's kind of a waste. So then finally, uh, we have photography. This is simply a, a very ethical issue of deception to consumers. Um, a lot of companies use motor oil, hairspray, deodorant, cotton balls, white glue, and many more to take pictures of their food to make it look a lot better than it really is. Um, cereal ads use um, glue instead of milk because this prevents the cereal from going soggy so it gives them a longer window to take pictures um, and also we have a picture of a cake here but this could be something very similar to what could be on one of your menus uh, it makes the cake look bigger when really it just has cardboard in between it um, next we look at menu pictures uh, the pictures you see on the menus often aren't what you get on your plate uh, this is an example of the Burger King Whopper. Uh, you can see it looks very different. And also, if they did make them as big as they want it, as big as the menu items, they usually don't fit in their desired boxes. So this is purely, if you actually get the Big Mac that you saw on the menu, it wouldn't fit in the box they serve it to you in. So with that said, uh, Cassie is now going to mention some of the financial and economical issues. Okay, big spenders. Uh, Three-fourths of the healthcare spending goes to preventable chronic diseases. These are diseases including smoking, poor eating habits, alcohol, and more. And again, they are preventable. Um, the U.S. spends about $1.8 trillion a year on medical costs associated with these chronic diseases. Uh, with, and uh, an obese person will have an average of 8,300 medical bills in 2018 compared to uh, 5,800 for an, a healthy person. And that's a difference of 2,500 between the people, and then this is per individual, so that's a big change. Uh, extra weight increases the risk of diabetes, heart disease, and many other types of cancers, resulting in higher health care costs. Um, so that means it affects everyone, especially the employers, when they have to pay a higher rate. the obesity trends in the U.S. from 1991 to 2010. And right off the bat, I want to let you know that the red orange is bad. Um, and as you can see, that's closer to our current time. With that said, blue is 20% or less of the population being obese in 1991 to 1995. And then blue and red orange is 30% or less of the population being obese from 1998 to 2010. And more than 50% of the population in the states could be obese by 2018. Um, as you can see, California is kind of lacking in the obesity, but it's catching up right there in the purple. And most of the southern states um, in the, sorry, there's a point. Most of the southern states down here are leaders in the obesity. Uh, with that said, one out of two people will be obese in some states, so that's me and you. So that's one out of two people will be obese, and obese is about 30 pounds overweight. It's a big, big difference. Um, and then 20 years ago, no state was above 15%. So that's a 
progress and change over this period of time. Now I'm going to cover the laws, regulations, and rules, uh, laws regarding restaurants, healthcare, and how uh, regulations for safety are becoming more focused on salts, calories, fats, and more. Restaurants, including franchises, uh, grocery stores, are required to post calorie information on menu boards. Um, this gives the customer the opportunity to better educate themselves. And then the FDA uh, will possibly change the serving sizes they're thinking about it. Because restaurants are off by 18% on average in serving sizes, so you think you're getting your correct proportion when you're actually getting 18% more or 18% less, so on average it's off by that. And then packaged foods is off about by 8%. Uh, this mislabeling needs to be adjusted, but the FDA worries that if they do adjust this mislabeling, that people will just eat more. So they'll raise it and then they'll eat more. Under the Affordable Care Act, people with pre-existing health conditions cannot be denied health insurance as of 2014. This is coming up uh, pretty soon when the law takes full effect. When health insurers can no longer evade much of the costs associated with the uh, collateral damage of the American diets, insurance premiums will go up, uh, balancing the additional costs, costing the companies more who employ. Uh, and then they will also move towards helping uh, the food reform, uh, kind of in a way that they did uh, smoking and alcohol. Uh, we'll look to see that in the future. And then additionally, uh, Medicare, a government program uh, that covers the elderly and some other elderly that are overweight, uh, likely the costs will go up with the, the increase in weight. With that said, I'm going to pass this to Erica, and she's going to cover the financials Thank and possible solutions. Thank you, Pastor. <clears throat> so in 2011, McDonald's decided to make apple slices a default item on their kids' menu. Uh, the numbers here are directly from McDonald's 2010 and 2012 financial statements. The 2010 numbers are, um, they represent the year before the apple slices, and the 2012 numbers represent the year after the apple slices were put on, on the, made a default item on the kids' menu. So 10% of McDonald's, roughly 10% of McDonald's sales come from um, their Happy Meals. Now, clearly in 2012, there's an increase, and we understand that there are probably other variables that affected that increase in 2012. But what we're trying to show here, or indicate here, is that um, when McDonald's decided to put um, healthier items on their menu, it didn't actually hurt their sales. Um, they also are now the leading purchaser of apples in the restaurant industry. So McDonald's announced in, that by 2020, they promised to reduce sugars, reduce um, saturated fats, and calories through very portion sizes, reformulations, and innovations. And by 2015, reduce their sodium by 15%. As most of us know, McDonald's is the leading company in the, in the restaurant industry right now. And McDonald's, who everyone associates unhealthy with is seeing that there is an open market for this and why can't why not try it out why not why should you not try out and see what they're doing because it's obviously um, definitely giving them it's, it's, it's a success for them sorry um, next we chose to do a sensitivity analysis on a real company these numbers come directly from the company's 2011 statements we anticipated that if they chose to put healthier items on their menu, their sales would increase by 10%. With that, cost of goods sold would increase by 7.5%. So in this case, sales would increase roughly $200 million, and cost of goods sold would increase roughly $100 million. This seems plausible, considering that the restaurants that chose to undergo healthier menu items ultimately increased their sales dollars, their overall profit, and their customer traffic. So ultimately, there is a wide open market for this, but as we mentioned earlier, people are just scared to make that change.
because what if they lose that? What if, they, what if it's not a success for them? Next, I'm going to cover some possible solutions for you guys. First thing is that you need to realize that there is a, a potential financial gain in, that you could create here. Um, as you'll see shortly, companies that have, incre have increased their traffic and transactions when they offered healthier menu items. Um, menu reconstructing is key. Most people are unaware of this, but the structure of a menu is a science in itself. So many companies will highlight their higher profit items. You'll see it real bit, really big on their menus, while they hide their lower profit items on the menu. So what, what you need to do is um, highlight your health, emphasize your healthier menu items to assist your customers. Next, these companies need to hold themselves accountable. Um, they have chosen to ignore the harm that they have done to their customers and the ill will that um, they've earned. In creating healthier menu items, um, you can definitely improve your image. And when you improve your image, you could possibly even increase your bottom line. Uh, finally, if any of you are restaurants that offer buffets, an option for you would to be, serve your, to be to serve your food on a blue plate because studies have shown that um, companies that serve the food on blue or just have any kind of um, like blue walls or soup serve on blue plates, it serves as an appetite suppressant. So, um, so not only will Sorry, They're, so your customers are going to be paying the same amount, but um, but eating less of your food. So this could increase your bottom line as well. Now I'm going to pass it off to Austin, who's going to discuss more of our or our, our solution. Okay, right, thank you, Eric. Okay. Dr. Wars is going to hand around a menu that we're going to discuss here very shortly. Wait for him to get there. Okay. So, the four of us, what we wanted to do, we decided to do a research study. And in that research study, we wanted to find out whether we can modify people's eating behaviors simply by modifying the menu. What we did was we created four menus. Um, in those four menus, we highlighted healthy options. We highlighted unhealthy options on one. We had a control, and we did both on one, which the both is what you have. Um, we had approximately 200 observations in this study, and this was done on a college campus. And we also did some price adjustments as well. What we found in the study was simply by adding the thumbs up or the positive reinforcement for the healthy options. In this case, the healthy options were items that had below 20% fat content. If we highlighted those, on average, we went from approximately 35% fat content with the control down two and a half percent simply by adding a thumbs up. That's a simple change that anybody in the restaurant industry could make if they choose to. Now, if we highlighted the unhealthy options, those are items that were considered to be above 40% fat content. Simple enough. That actually decreased it another three percent simply by adding a thumbs down. Not a major change once again. Now, say we did both. We did that, we checked that as well. If you have both on there, it's a compounding effect. What happened in this case, you're going from 35%, you're taking a 6% decrease in that fat content on average for their decisions. So you're going, on average, they went from 35%, they went down to roughly 29% fat content on average for those that took the study. Um, on average, we mentioned a little bit ago that customers seem to not have a willingness to pay extra for healthy options. In our study, we wanted to check that as well, see what people would say. On average, for lunch, they were spending, on average, $5.45 for lunch. Now, what we wanted to do, well, we asked them, are you willing to pay a little bit more for a healthier option? And if so, how much? What we found, on average, out of our observations, was that they were willing to spend an extra dollar and 15 cents. Okay, so you're looking up to a little over 650. We can find something on a menu for 650 that's fairly healthy. Um, the price adjustment results are inconclusive, and those would require further study. 
Okay. So as Eric, you may be wondering where Erica got her numbers from earlier about the 10% and the 7.5%. The 10% is based off of the study done by the Hudson Institute. What they wanted to find out was simply for 21 different restaurants, some of, you, some of them maybe your restaurants, what they wanted to find out was if the restaurant chains decided to increase their healthy options, what would it do to their traffic and what would it do to their transactions? Okay, you increase your healthy options, simple enough. You're looking at an average 9% increase in your customer, or in your total food servings. So you're having more transactions in that case. You take those away, you're looking at over a 16% drop in your total food servings. That there indicates that customers do care whether you have healthy options. You're taking away 16% of your market, that's a huge hit for you. You don't want that to happen. Further study with the Hudson Institute, it's actually the same study. In this case, they wanted to just check the traffic count. So the people that are coming in and out of the restaurants, your, your customers, with those 21 restaurants, once again, you add those healthy options, you're increasing your traffic count almost 11% simply by adding a healthy option or two. You take those away, you're looking at a 15% drop. Once again, I don't believe you all want to have a 15% drop. I may be wrong, but you're in the business to make money. If you're in the business to make money, you don't want to lose customers, simple. So, the grease at the bottom of the bag, we're simply going to wrap this up. In reality, restaurants have an ethical responsibility. You need to care about your customers because your customers are the ones making you money. If you don't have customers coming in that are happy and healthy, what's the point? You don't have, you can be harming your customers, you can be hurting your image simply by not encouraging people to eat healthier or educating them at the very least. You have a fear that profits are going to dwindle. As we can see there, you're increasing your traffic count simply by adding. You're increasing your transactions simply by adding. It's not hard. Or you can do what we did, which is simply just indicate what helps. I mean, if you indicate what's positive, what's negative, at least people have the option to choose what they want. That's what we're asking you to do. We don't want to take anything away from all of you. That's not our case. Our case is that we want you to help the customers. Help the customers, they'll help you back. Simple enough. Uh, in that case, you will also be maintaining a profit, which, as we all know, you guys want a profit. Let's be honest there. And finally, the healthy restaurant industry, as it were, is wide open. Um, here in California, there are a few chains that offer healthy options. Back where we're from, nothing. There is nothing. Okay, we live outside of St. Louis, there is nothing there. You go to the south, you're looking at the same thing. You go to maybe northeast, big cities, sure. Outside where we're at, no. Some one of you take advantage of that, you're looking at a wide open market, and I can guarantee you, there's college students that care. I can tell you, there's some of us that care. Okay? We care. You should care. What you're doing, you're creating a market for yourself. Use that market, tap that market, make money on that market. And with that, we will take questions. Thank you for listening. Tell me in advance, and I thought I could have made my famous cheesecake. God knows how many calories that has. <laughs> so I went to the Cheesecake Factory. You guys have Cheesecake Factory nearby? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you can buy an entire cake from them. So I bought the cake, brought it home, and then happened to realize that it had the calorie count on the top per slice. One piece of cheesecake exceeds the calorie count for an adult male, never mind those of us who are females. One slice, there were I think 16 slices in this cake. It's great value for the money. But literally, you can take a slice, cut it into three pieces, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and that's the only way you could eat it and not and not gain weight. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, it was a real, it was a total revelation. Um, our mayor, Mayor Bloomberg in New York, mm -hmm. has decided that all fast food restaurants have to post calorie counts. He did not make that applicable to the restaurants in the neighborhood. So God only knows how many calories there are in the blue cheese dressing, you know, at the local uh, uh, Greek restaurant. When you created this, you show one variable, high and low fat, correct? Correct. Did, did you give 
did you give thought to putting the calorie counts for the items, one, and two, do you know if there's any empirical evidence that if you post the calorie count that people will not, will opt for the lower calorie item as opposed to the higher calorie alternative? Actually, just something, yesterday we went to In-N-Out Burger. Oh, oh, that's an experience. We, yeah, <laughs> we went against our whole thing and went to in and out burger. <laughs> but we, we thought about, we thought about getting, getting a, a shake, and they have it posted on there. It's like 560 calories for a shake. None of us got it. So I mean, that's just a little. Sample. So when you began your 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 um, your presentation, I where I thought you were going was to say that everybody had to have calorie counts on all the items. Okay, but that's not how the presentation played out. So I'm wondering why. And if the reason why that. we didn't test that is because it's required to be posted on menu boards already. So we wanted to oh, test okay. something that hasn't been uh, tested yet. I had a question. What What was your um, criteria for the good and the bad? Like, what were the cutoff points? Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, I guess I didn't say that. What it was was for thumbs up, which the healthy options, it was below 20% or below on the fat oh, content. Okay. If it was above 40%, we considered that unhealthy. The reason we chose those numbers is we actually consulted with a registered dietitian who works for the university, and we sat down with her and we asked her, if you were setting this up, how do you think you would do it? But she said, after debating it, she's like, well, the best option is probably fat content because that's the thing people understand. You look at calories, a lot of people, it's a number to people. And as we saw, that number can be effective, but fat content, we all we understand fat content. Um, where if it's, we can, we can see it in an argument, if it's below 20% in that meal, it's probably better for you than something that's 40%. Does that make sense? So yeah. there's our ethical dilemma as restaurateurs. We're saying that, um, mm -hmm. that it's, you should feel guilty, almost, uh, offering this terrible food to your consumers. Uh, <laughs> and that, you know, that those calories that you're giving them aren't helping them at all. There's no nutritional benefit from the food that you're serving. Um, essentially, you're killing your consumers, almost. I mean, obviously, there are other parts that play into their but, lifespan. But, but what if, but for example, in this menu, I could order, I could go and have lunch, and I could choose to have an appetizer, a soup, a salad, which is, I guess that's the good part, a sandwich, a pasta, and a personal pizza, right? All of which are, if I select correctly, I can select all healthy options, but that's a heck of a lot of food for lunch, right? Yeah. However, at the same time, you're telling them at least what's healthy. I mean, you could ignore that completely. See, if you were my mayor, he would say you're not allowed to have a dessert in that. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't have that. <laughs> also, no. sorry. Also, there's many people with medical problems. Mm -hmm. And as Danny mentioned, the buzzwords, less fat, no added sugars. Most people should probably know that if they have a medical problem, but sorry, go ahead. So let me ask you, so as restaurateurs, are you suggesting that we could fulfill our ethical obligation by having a menu which says welcome to our restaurant, and then about our restaurant, when we say no added sugars, it means we're not adding anything in. We do not add salt. I mean, couldn't you do it that way? Yeah. Yeah, you could. Yeah. You could have some kind of key at the bottom saying no added sugars. I mean, it's, it's pretty blatant, but at least you're putting yourself out there to make sure that you've done your job. So financially, as a restaurateur, I've got a menu. It's been designed. My chefs know how to cook it. Isn't that the easier way for me to feel like I'm doing something ethical by just labeling my menu but leaving the status quo? Or is that less ethical? Um, in a way, if you think about it, there are empty calories that you can take. Yes, if you get a cheeseburger, obviously you're going to have a bunch of calories with some protein, but it doesn't have vitamins, it doesn't have minerals, it doesn't have all those items that individuals are supposed to intake to uh, support their body. And with that said, it's almost comparable to alcohol, in a way. In a way, not 
not entirely because alcohol has calories, but does it have nutritional value to it? Cheeseburger has calories, does it have nutritional value to it? Other than protein. So there's different aspects. So maybe if they supplement it by adding different vitamins and minerals and things of that nature to it, it would make it a little bit so you better. Have a question on yeah, I do, I do. Preservatives as well. Well, actually, okay. I'm gonna give you an example. I run, I run executive at Cracker Barrel, which is in the South. Mm -hmm. Our big selling items, believe me, when people drive through and having grown up in Oklahoma, and family in Arkansas and love going through Louisiana. People love mashed potatoes, mm. gravy, Comfort. real fried chicken, and biscuits. Now, we have people that come in and grace, you know, we could cut, but we use real potatoes too. We don't use box potatoes. And our customers like the butter. So I'm just concerned because they do stop, and we're famous for that. Not Cracker Barrel cheese, but we're famous for that, just as some of our competitors are all through the South, because that's what people grew up with. So let me ask you, what would you do, what would you suggest, and also, question for you. <laughs> how would you add vitamins and minerals to your meat or to your sandwich? I mean, how would you do that? Because if you're telling me that beef doesn't have vitamins and minerals, how are you going to do it? But first I want to ask you, what's going on? Because I'm from the South and Cracker Barrel and we don't have and, and we don't have in and out. Yeah. And we, we don't, don't have, we don't but we're big on Kentucky Fried Chicken, and we don't have a lot of McDonald's. We don't have a lot of that. And you keep talking about McDonald's and In-N-Out and those fast food, but we don't really have that. We love to sit down. Okay, so let me ask you, what would you do? Because I, my customers are loyal. They want to come in. And people that know our name want to stop on their driving way. Driving okay. For us, our biggest argument with this case, we don't want you all to take stuff off the menu at all. We don't want that. We don't want to take options from the customers. What we want is for all of you to at least inform your customers. We're not saying, okay, all that we do is unhealthy options. Cracker Barrel, I've been to Cracker Barrel, I love Cracker Barrel, but Cracker Barrel, if you're going to Cracker Barrel, you know you're getting unhealthy. However, at the same time, a restaurant needs to be willing, or should be willing at least, to commit to their customers. Commit that we're here, yes we want to serve you, but at the same time we care about your health, at least to an extent. So in your case, with Cracker Girl, it's similar to what the rest of them have done. We still want you to at least inform your customers, hey, we know you're here, we know why you're here. It's like, we know that we serve unhealthy food. That's obvious, it's a given. However, even though it's a given, at least let the customers have an idea what they're getting. Um, you already have nutritional facts, we, we get that. But in our case, we set it up on the menu, simply because we just wanted to see if there was a fat, um, which there is. At least in this instance, we can't make a broad generalization across everything because we don't have the data for that. But for Cracker Grill, yes, everything's unhealthy. We get that. Everything's unhealthy? Not everything. Uh, no. My mashed potatoes are unhealthy. My chicken's but unhealthy. But they're wonderful <laughs> tasting. Well, uh, no, they're real potatoes. They're yeah. not so it's a fake good one potatoes. With your question of how could we change that, you could have the, the famous fried chicken, mashed potatoes, gravy, and you could probably have it and it'll come on a plate this big, but big enough to feed two, three people. So how about have that still on the menu, but maybe offer it as a lighter dish, a smaller size dish, for those people who are still trying to watch their weight, but don't want to take away the fact of your famous fried chicken, mashed potatoes, gravy, but they, they so they are still eating somewhat of a healthy, healthier meal because they're eating less, but it's still got the same taste and good that they know that they're getting at Cracker Barrel. Like so I'm gonna cut my price too. Maybe a little. You could essentially half the portion size, but not necessarily half the price. So therefore, they're actually getting the sit or half the amount of food, but they're still paying 
close to the full price for it. But also, there are people that avoid going to Cracker Barrel because they know they're going to go there and eat a lot of calories, a lot of fats. So for someone that's that likes that food but is avoiding it because they don't want that, say here, oh, you, they have a lighter, lighter menu option for this. Okay, I'm probably going to go there now because I know I'm not going to get a huge plate and eat it all. Because if it's in front of you, most of the time you're going to eat it all. <laughs> so. It's changing that image, essentially. It's so, like I mean, Erica said, going from no one wants to go there because they know they're going to eat a huge plate of food. If they now hear that, oh, well, Cracker Barrel is actually offering that awesome traditional food, but on a small plate, well, cool, that's a win-win. Another judge question? Anybody? We got one. Here's my question. In your presentation, you told me that, that there was a moral obligation to the customer to the extent that it didn't lower my profits. Indeed, that if I would include more healthy food items, which isn't just a trend, it could possibly even increase my profits. Persuasively, what I really like about what you did, because it was very persuasive, was that you told me I, I had a moral obligation to the customer, but that moral obligation was always subservient to sort of a subtle, greater obligation, aka to myself, my profit, and my business. So here's my question. Would I still be morally obligated as a restaurant owner, being a free agent morally, and dealing with other free and responsible agents and customers? Would I still be morally obligated if that, to the extent, proviso was removed? AKA, am I obligated to provide healthy foods to my customers for short-term or long-term benefit if it wouldn't um, benefit me financially? And if so, what's the bound, what, what's, the, what's the foundation, what's the basis of that moral obligation for me as a restaurant owner? And, um, and why am I obligated to that as opposed to, say, the individual himself or the parent for the child? Um, essentially, with that case, we do still feel that you have an obligation. However, going with the uh, parenting and the individual, there's also an obligation there. We're not saying there isn't. Well, we have never mentioned that. And the reason for that is because we do feel that there is a, com a compound invested interest. I should care about myself. Um, the people that I work with should have at least some care for me. Um, obviously, if I'm not willing to help myself, why should anybody else? I'm still willing to help myself. The general customer should be willing to help themselves. Now, you take that away, that you aren't making profits, we still want you to do something. Um, in this case, what we did was just to see. Um, we had uh, on this menu, we wanted to check, not necessarily how much it was gonna affect your bottom line, but we wanted to see could you help your customers. All right, say you cut into your profit margins to an extent. How much are we talking? We're not sure because we don't have the data on that. Um, you didn't bring up the numbers, so I don't know exactly. Uh, however, there are other ways to adjust that. Say you are extremely heavy in advertising. Why must you be extremely heavy in advertising? Do you not feel that your customers are sharing with each other? Word of mouth. There are certain chains that we know of that don't rely on advertising at all. Um, there are certain massive chains that we all know and they still rely on advertising, correct? Um, for instance, McDonald's, Subway, any of those, we, we've heard before. If you cut back, say you cut back on the advertising expense, then could that level it out? Potentially. Could you cut back on overhead? Potentially. There are ways to look at things to adjust that back out. Now, how much of an effect? There, the net effect may be zero, it may be a little bit less, but at the same time, you're enhancing your brand image, you're increasing the awareness overall. Does that make sense? Okay, good. With that, the business is a lot about repeat customers. Um, someone can come in and spend a huge check, but if they don't come back ever again, then it's not very beneficial for your business. 
So if you serve someone healthy food, they're usually happy. You know, you hear the thing, if you're healthy, you're happy. Um, using the in and out thing last night is these girls have said they're not going back there because they weren't happy with the food they got. It wasn't even comforting and it, they knew it was unhealthy. So if you, even if you kind of lose a little bit of your profit on the food that you're serving because it's healthier, if they are going to buy that and then come back again, who's to say the next time they go for a more profit, profitable item? But as long as you get them back into your business, I think that's that's where you can possibly raise your profits. I have a question for you over there. Okay. If you are a restaurant association, why aren't you telling us all as the restaurant owners, because hopefully we're all making profits, that we need to support politicians like Michael Bloomberg who are going to pass laws which will mandate disclosure as opposed to me deciding voluntarily I'm going to disclose my calorie content or my fat content, that everybody across the board will have to do that so that if I actually have healthier food, I'm going to profit more than if I who does it. it it'll likely make the transition a little bit easier for you instead of when the law is enacted and you so change are you, everything. Are you pro or anti-regulation or regulation neutral? Um, it depends on the regulation. Uh, disclosure of calorie counts, that content. I believe that education is key to helping individuals choose items that they necessarily may not know is unhealthy for them. I didn't ask you that. Are you, as a, in what you're telling us in terms of the ethical dilemma, the business ramifications, and the legal, as a, as a um, as the association, is the association pro disclosure, mandatory disclosure? Yeah, yeah. I'd yes. say we are. Um, if ideally, yeah, we would love to get regulations in place and laws and the legal for restaurants to have to put these the plus sign or the thumbs up sign on the menus. But we're saying because nothing is coming in as of yet, you could be that first restaurant that does it and makes the change and other people are now gonna follow. So I guess that's how it So I have a question. I mean, I'm not a big Bloomberg fan. Okay. <laughs> All right, but I, my question is this. Okay. It's coming into everybody's bedroom. Um, yeah, I, my question is this. I know that Kentucky Fried Chicken all the way across the state he regulates it in New York City, not New York State, New York City, everybody has to do it. But what is your feeling, because then that's not that's just a mayor of a city, the government coming in. Now here, I mean almost every restaurant does. Like, in and out may not because it's a chain. I, I don't go there, but anyway. <laughs> but I do go, we'll look at Kentucky Fried Chicken and places. But, you know, you want the government, not just an individual, but the entire U.S. government coming in and dictating yes. this. The FDA, now, yes, or say the president came in and said, this is what I believe, or his wife. Now, do you want that demand coming in? What would you say, I mean, or the FDA? That would be ideal, I think, honestly. Which one, the FDA or the federal government? Or, or, or the, 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 president. the president. The, president. President. the, president. the, president. the FDA, president. because it is a kind of a known name what if you see that FDA is requiring their calorie and fat or whatever it might be on the menus then you know that it's somewhat it's correct sort of thing um, whereas like you said if a restaurant was still on their own they could essentially put up whatever but if the FDA regulate it then it's definitely more um, credible and what about things like sodium because sodium it can be low calorie oh yeah but the high sodium would you expect that to be on it? Mm -hmm. yes. Because just besides calories, that can be really yeah, low. But the high sodium makes a difference. One of the things we were looking at in our menus, as I mentioned, was we weren't sure exactly which route to take, what's healthy, what's not. Um, but after the discussion, we realized, OK, there's going to be more to this than fat content. There's going to be more to this than calorie content. I mean, you have to look at all the macronutrients, all that other stuff. You have to look at sodium, you have to look at calories, you have to look at fat, you have to look at protein, you have to look at all this. Um, however, with, even with that in place, I think we all pretty much agree, I hope that they agree with me on this, because we haven't discussed this part. <laughs> but let's hope they do. Um, I think for us was what we were recommending is that we need one 
restaurant to step out. Just one. If one restaurant steps up and says, hey, here's the deal, we know we have a problem, but we know that our customers are who we care about. We know that our customers are the ones that make us money. We know that our customers' children are going to make us money in the long run. Say they step out and say that, okay? At that point, they have committed to their customers. They have said, okay, we know who we are, we know who you are, we care about you, we want to help you. What we want out of you is just want you to step up and say that. If you do that, you're committing to your customers, your customers know that you're committing to them. And then you're helping them in the long run. You're saying, okay, here's the deal. We have all this stuff, we know it's not great for you, but at the same time, at least we're willing to tell you it's not great for you. It's like, if you don't want to take the, or take the, or if you want to take the unhealthy options, that's fine. You're willing to say that. Uh, Are you just finished? Oh, yeah, absolutely, okay. Okay. please. Uh, Would you entertain a couple more? Where are the two judges have any questions? Would you be willing to entertain a little bit more? But I, I did cut you off. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. I have another question. Sure. <laughs> the health cost. Yes. I thought I was impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I, as a restaurateur, question how you connect food portions at restaurants to obesity, to healthcare costs. I mean, maybe it's not the restaurant portions, maybe it's the snack Grandma. foods and the sugary laden drinks and the over Grandma, zealous. Grandma's apple, apple yeah. And the vending machines. And the vending machines that are driving this plus a lack of exercise. So how do you, how do you address that? Well, it's... I mean, obviously, it's a combination of all those things that's increasing obesity. It's not just restaurants. Um, individuals are eating out more, but it is everything. And with if restaurants were to make a change, they might possibly react to other changes, and individuals might focus a little more on uh, supplying healthier uh, options and just educating people to let them know exactly what they're getting. Also, what was that number, 200? 209 meals. That's how much an American is on average purchasing a year. 209 meals on average. So, I mean, that's, they're eating out a lot. We're saying, why not promote the healthiness? And also with the, with the insurance, it, it's going to go up. No matter what, are you a company that provides benefits to your employee, employers or employees? Sorry, benefits to your employees. Well, that price is going to go up. So why should you not be concerned about offering healthier menu items? Because that's more money out of your pocket. I think to add a point to both of them, Cassie just hit on it barely. Um, in general, people are busy. Correct. And I think we can all say today we are busy people. Um, we're all college students, but we're all extremely busy. We're all business executives or professors, or in your case, your restaurant executives. You're busy, okay? As Erica mentioned, people are eating out an average of 209 times a year. Um, you figure that up, that's probably a fourth of your meals a year. You probably, I, this is just a guess. If you go back 30 years, that number's gonna be lower. I'm just guess. Obviously, I wasn't around at that time, but just to guess, more than likely you're not, you weren't eating out as much. Sure, there is a combination of all of that that you mentioned. However, at the same time, since people are busier, since people have to eat out more because they don't have the time, if you're just letting that go, you ignore, you tend to be ignoring the fact that it's like, we are committed, we are causing some problems to our customers. Sure, they do have individual choices. Sure, they could go to a different restaurant, but do you want to risk that? Do you want them to go to a different restaurant simply because you don't have a healthy option or simply because you don't inform them? I don't believe so. I may be wrong, but I don't personally know a business that intentionally sends their customers to somebody else simply because they don't want to try something. Um, if I knew a business that did that, I, like, I'd love to talk to their executive simply just see what he's thinking. <laughs> because to me, that, sound, that seems like terrible business strategy to say, okay, we don't like what you think, get away from here. We don't want you. You don't want that. You don't want to turn away customers completely simply because you don't want to tell them something. 
That's not sound business. You want your customers to be informed. Let them choose to come to you. If they choose to come to you, you have found a solid customer. You have found a customer that's going to come back. You have found their they're going to tell their friends, they're going to tell their family, they're going to tell people they meet. It's like, hey, go to that restaurant. That's a good restaurant. They care about me. They offer healthy stuff. They let, they tell me what I need, or they give me an idea. Well, here's the deal. Here's what's in our meals. They tell me that. If they tell me that, I'm going to tell other people that. I'm going to share that. In the long run, you're increasing your customer traffic, as was the case in the study, which is a huge deal. Let's, uh, do we have one more judge's question? I just have a comment. Okay. Can I make a comment? Oh, did you want to wait till we move into feedback? Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Thank you for that. And now, uh, now the judges have some uh, okay. constructive feedback for you. Can I get, I'd like to give you some feedback on your presentation and years that you're noting. Okay. If, if you're the restaurant association and you're selling this to us, restaurant owners I would suggest don't go back as far as you did on like 1977 or 70 don't go back so far because these people may not even have been around I mean I was but I was you know I was somewhere else in the world um, but I mean actually I was working in restaurants in a ski resort in 1977 but a lot of these people you're dealing with aren't even going to remember that. That's like talking to somebody about the depression. Right. So if you just go back, a few, give them statistics from so many years back, but don't go clear back. Because remember, a lot of these people aren't going to be that you're trying to convince. Are going to be in their thirties that are running. You know, a manager that wants to accept it. You know, maybe the executive sixty or fifty, but they're all coming up younger. So I would suggest kind of. Not going clear back as far as you did. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think I would have liked, and, and you did hit on it and touch on it in different ways, but I think I would have liked to appear a little more directly that that we have an ethical responsibility to our customers and you know to our you know to people in general to be open and transparent and and that there is a benefit to that and in, in that it builds trust and um, but just that our, you know we're all. We, that, that basically that we have an ethical responsibility to the well-being of our customers, and and it, it was stated, but it was um, like he said a lot a lot of it was connected to well, and it's good for money too. It's good for money too, but just kind of blatantly stated that like you know you, you want to be ethical, you want to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, yeah. and for that specifically. So I would have liked to hear that a little bit more, a little bit more explicitly. But it, you did you did touch on it. Uh, so let me let me give you uh, yeah very good very good job let me give you the uh, way to go feedback and the developmental both so loved the numbers up front thought that was awesome got my attention numbers get people's attention especially <coughs> right so that was wonderful I like the catchy headlines I mean I was taught to do powerpoints I used to work for Capital One and it's like it's a headline, it's not just some kind of soft, puffy title. And you gave a lot of your stuff for just, they grabbed you, which is very good. Um, I would have done a little bit earlier to help that healthy options are good and you won't lose profitability. Remember that part? It came a little bit later and, and, and uh, say why and how. It just didn't come across to me the why and the how of it. And. Later on, you got into some financial models and assumptions. I might have done it there, because I just kept waiting, okay, give me the model, show me where it's gonna, show me the numbers, how it's gonna work. Um, felt a little accusing, the big attack on misleading marketing, <laughs> coming to a restaurant tour, right? <laughs> Serving size picture was compelling. I thought that was very good. And so are the statistics, right? I thought those were excellent. That, 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 that was very good. That really grabbed me. But then I didn't, on the other hand, I didn't get the relevance of the pictures showing food looking, you know, the cardboard and the cake and whatnot. Pretty. Looking prettier or larger than it really was. I mean, what's the relevance of that to this? Maybe I missed something. But isn't it better that it's actually smaller? That's what I was thinking, right? Um, Good job defending the position on the health cost, the question I had, and you all just jumped in to help, which I liked. 
and uh, and add on to it. You really, I like connecting with the 209. Is that you or one of you? Yeah. That that made it more like, oh wow, I didn't know people ate out 209. That's a lot. Um, the Obamacare, I just didn't get the issue. So something was, it may have just been my, I, I, I got lost there. And the apples on the arches was excellent. That was very persuasive to me, very good. And the Sense City analysis was good too. I liked all that, but I would have said, tell me a little bit about some of the assumptions you made in that or what they were made by whoever did it to make it more credible and believable. Uh, and then I thought the ethical responsibility I think the argument could have been strengthened somewhat by saying a few more things just to boost it up. It just felt like it's, it's unethical and yeah, you should know that. You know, maybe care about your customer, maybe even as puffy as I mean, I just felt like I was waiting for more argument and persuasion why it was ethical. But overall, you had a difficult topic with a, you know, skeptical audience. <laughs> so, great job. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so now, first of all, I have to go try Cracker Barrel because I'm a northerner. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that they had restaurants. Just oh, yeah, singing it down. So oh, yeah. Now, <laughs> like, She's gotten me so hungry now for mashed potatoes. That, but, that was our okay. plan was to make sure everyone was hungry. I was throwing out all of my dishes and buying blue dishes <laughs> <laughs> because I learned something. And now I can tell my friend who's very skinny who lives in the house in blue. We call it everything yeah. is blue. Now I know why because the whole house is blue. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm throwing out all my, all my beige and greens and going blue. Um, one notable thing about this team, four people, tremendous consistency in the skill set, okay? Everybody was good on this team. It wasn't like there's a superstar and so we were talking about supersizing earlier, but you know, there, there wasn't one superstar and three people dragging along. Four people, everybody pulled their equal weight. You all have equivalent calorie counts, et cetera, et cetera. So that was very, very impressive. Um, and that's something that I certainly like to see in a team. I'm going to concur in every single thing that Alan said. I love starting off with the numbers. You grab the attention. The attention fled when we got into the sort of soft, mushy stuff, but it was definitely up there. I love the use of the menu. I thought that was that was very, very catchy. I knew it was coming, but I knew it was coming in a very tasty way. Um, <laughs> uh, little criticism, don't read from your note cards. It detracts from very, very great personalities, great eye contact, but it does detract. So if you were doing this as a real business presentation, you have to practice in the mirror and just, you know, throw out the note cards. Um, my only issue is I kept saying to myself, where's an ethical dilemma for me as, an eth as a restaurateur? It's a pain in the neck for me to change my menu to, to show this kind of stuff. It certainly could be costly for me to call in a dietitian to say, listen, we can figure some of my stuff to make it healthier, you know, to make an alternate um, version. But I didn't, I didn't find any great push-pull ethically as to what was going on here. It was more the reason that I should be informing my public a certain way. Um, so when you don't have a strong ethical dilemma as much, it can detract from the presentation only because what are we arguing about? Which is why I love when Sylvia was questioning you about the people down south and what they feel the need for, you know? And, and the fact that well, you eat at home, you know, what, what, you know, you can go, be, some, there are some people who are very neurotically good in front of other people <laughs> that not eating and at midnight they're at their own refrigerator yeah. <laughs> shuffling it in. So um, I wasn't quite sure what the connection was, although admittedly, um, I will tell you, near the courthouse, there was a single healthy restaurant. So well, it was one worse than the next. Um, so that was my only negative was the, um, you know, was the lack of um, the ethical dilemma or discussion of individual action, um, as opposed to putting burden on us as restaurateurs. Um, but overall, I thought it was very, it was, it was an enjoyable, perfect presentation before lunch. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, I thought that it was, that it was. Um, um, it, it, it was very, very well done. I think the num numbers, you showed where the good use of numbers matter. Sometimes we see numbers used very poorly or where do they fit in. The numbers really fit here. And um, I, I, I really enjoyed them. Thank you. you. Oh, Carl? Uh, what you had here is not ethical 
issue, but an ethical opportunity. And in the field of corporate social responsibility, an opportunity for restaurants to step up and use corporate social responsibility to be better businesses. Uh, John Cotter has an eight-step process for implementing change. His first step is to create a feeling of urgency about the need for change. You had a step at the beginning of your presentation that was, I think, designed to create urgency, but it's currently aimed at the customers and how the customers should change. And I think if you could figure out a way to aim that at the restaurateurs, the urgency for them to change, then you'd be stronger. You did that later on when you got around to benchmarking McDonald's and saying, look, McDonald's is undertaking this corporate social responsibility initiative, and look what is happening to their business and their profits. They're going up. We know there are lots of restaurants that are open, lots of restaurants that close. Failure in the restaurant industry is very high. Uh, so if I'm running a restaurant, my concern is getting customers in so I can keep the doors open. I'm going to serve them whatever they want. And <clears throat> if I can do a better job through corporate social responsibilities, that would be something I want to learn about. So that's a direction I would steer you. Thank you. Thank you. Overall, I thought this was a phenomenal persuasive presentation. I was I was emotionally persuaded. Um, ethically, I, I'm not sure I was completely convinced, but let me just say a few things first. One, communications, visuals, stuff is all convention. The numbers was great. I appreciated the stories, the kind of meta-narrative of the menu throughout, food titles. That's just really good. Because you're not you want to be ethical, but you're not talking to a room of ethical philosophers. You're talking to restaurateurs. And so, I could be totally wrong here, but I I liked what I perceived. I'm trying to stand above this thing is a little bit of moral sleight of hand. It's for the restaurateur, it's for his profit and his benefit to an extent, but it's also for the customers. And so it's couched within kind of this utilitarian thing, you know, the greatest good, the greatest happiness for the greatest number, but ultimately you're talking about people who own restaurants, so you've got to have the money thing in there as well as the long-term and the short-term goal, and I think, I really do think you accomplished that. <coughs> when I say I was ethically unconvinced, it's because I'm not sure I necessarily agree with utilitarianism pragmatically applied as the right way to go about reforming the system, but you accomplished what you set out to do. The system is broken, and you offered up some solutions that I may not totally agree with, but that doesn't matter, because I think if someone had been listening to this, they would have loved the whole piece. This isn't a trend. We need to get on this. You know, if you want to make money, there's a new generation coming up. You know, they, they did get drunk and cracker barrel with their parents, but the reality is they're all Tons of them are shopping at Whole Foods, they're willing to pay the money, you know, they're all going on weird paleo diets. <laughs> they think good fats are good for you, and you know, there there is a new sense of education. And for those who kind of aren't willing to take that step, um, educating them is important. Because I think when it comes to food, a lot of I, I mean what's so difficult about giving people what they want is biologically, you know, fat, salt, sugar. We're wired for these things. Um, <laughs> And so this is a really difficult thing for a restaurant association to try to push back against not only biology, but profits. And so you had to couch it in a way of this increases the happiness for everybody and pragmatically there are solutions. The one part I got hung up on was, but what we really want is the government to regulate everything. Because there's a whole sort of, um, there was an implied egoism. The restaurant tour has freedom. In fact, in this competing market of restaurants, the one who takes the first step they're going to get the benefit. So which one of you restaurant tours is going to be the individual of the more individual freedom to take the first step? And then all of a sudden there was this juxtaposition to really eventually want the government to decide for everybody. 
then all of a sudden the novelty and the freedom of the restaurant tour is removed. Therefore, I didn't really think there was a, a grounding in ethical necessity, but there was an incentive. That's what uh, Carl Craig said. There was an incentive to do this and you will live. And I, I really like that. So anyway, great, uh, great presentation. I felt I just wanted to say this, this whole like bringing of the law and kind of crushing people before you give them solutions. As far as, uh, <laughs> as, far as like, persuasive communication classes in, you know, go Bobcats, whatever you guys are. Bearcat. Bear <laughs> I'm not saying persuasive calling the Bearcat you. I mean, that's what they're going to tell you. In your marketing section, you made me feel like a liar. You know, I felt guilty. <laughs> in the spending section, you made me feel like an evil person. You're hurting people. And you implied, you imposed upon me this sense of intentionality. We know what you're doing. Now, I didn't like that, but at the same time, I needed to hear that. Uh, and then the last one, this isn't just a trend, so don't be afraid. You kind of disassembled. You, you showed me morally what I was really doing. And that, that, open, that opening of the wound allowed you to then come step in and do the surgery of providing the solutions. So, good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our background and working with associations, you might think about in your presentation giving the restaurant owners some marketing solutions like they go up to their city council or they go into the mayor and say, Oh, we have this great idea to help the city, or we have this, and you're the restaurant that goes up first and steps up and comes up with an idea that you can have a content, whatever it is. They did something to do with that like this. So you might just think about, you know, bringing up something that you're the initiator and other restaurants want to get involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our judges are going to complete their uh, judging forms, and uh, you're certainly welcome to stick around and visit. Thank you very much for being here. Good job.